welcome to Arbitral Insights, a podcast series brought to you by our international arbitration practice lawyers here at Reed Smith. I'm Peter Rocha, Global Head of Reed Smith's International Arbitration Practice. I hope you enjoy the industry commentary, insights and anecdotes we share with you in the course of this series, wherever in the world you are. If you have any questions about any of the topics discussed, please do contact our speakers. Welcome to our Women in Arbitration podcast mini-series, a platform for women's voices across the global international arbitration community. I'm Lucy Winnington Ingram, an international arbitration lawyer based in Reed Smith's London office. In these episodes, we will hear from leading women in the international arbitration space and discuss industry news, trends, developments and matters of interest. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of Arbitral Insights. I'm Michelle Nelson, a partner in Reed Smith's Dubai office, and I also appear as an advocate and sit as an arbitrator. I'm joined by my colleague, Alison Eslick, a senior associate in our Dubai office. And today we're going to give a brief rundown on enforcement of arbitral awards around the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council countries. It's certainly a dynamic region, and as we start 2022, there have been many important developments to reflect on over recent years. Both Alison and I have been closely following these, and our focus today will be on the United Arab Emirates, where we are both based, but also on the state of Qatar, the Sultanate of Oman, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where we regularly conduct arbitrations. So I'd like to start with Qatar, and I'm going to hand over to Alison. Thanks, Michelle. Look, there have been a number of positive developments in Qatar over the past few years, which have thankfully cleared up some niggling issues that have undermined its enforcement reputation. Now, one of these niggling issues stemmed from a judgment of the Qatar Court of First Instance in 2016, which concerned an ICC Paris seated award that the award creditor sought to enforce in Qatar. Rather infamously, the court held that because the award had not been issued in the name of Qatar's emir, this violated public policy and the award was unenforceable. Now, this 2016 decision predated Qatar's 2017 arbitration law and was justified by the court based on Qatar's civil and commercial procedures law, which provides that all judgments in Qatar shall be issued in the name of the emir. Now, this decision certainly surprised the arbitration community at the time because it wasn't anticipated that procedures relating to court judgments would or indeed should be applied to awards. However, we now have some clarity because in 2019, the Qatar court took a different approach, holding that it is not mandatory for an award to be rendered in the name of the emir. There was detailed and very sensible reasoning for this, and listeners can certainly reach out to us if they want to know some more. But hopefully this clears up that issue once and for all. Now, the second development, Michelle, relates to a judgment of the Qatar Court of Appeal in 2020 that refused to set aside an ICC award on the basis that one of the parties to the arbitration was not represented by local Qatari advocates. It was argued here by the award creditor that this violated the Qatari advocacy law and the arbitration law, as well as the arbitral tribunal's procedural orders. Now, the Court of Appeal rejected this argument, holding that an irregularity in the legal representation of the parties does not constitute grounds to set aside an arbitration award. Here, the appellant had also provided a power of attorney for its international lawyers And the applicable ICC rules certainly didn't limit the party's appointment of international counsel. So this decision is obviously a great comfort to parties with ongoing arbitrations seated in Qatar, since, of course, we know that parties are frequently represented by international advocates. Now, Michelle, despite these very positive developments, it is worth noting the 2021 Australian case of Hub Street Equipment Proprietary Limited and Energy City Qatar Holding Company. Now, in that case, the full court of the Federal Court of Australia declined to enforce a Qatari award because there the arbitral tribunal had not been composed in accordance with the arbitration agreement. 
So what happened was that Qatar's Court of First Instance actually appointed all three tribunal members, even though the party's arbitration agreement stipulated that each party was to nominate an arbitrator, with the president to be selected by the co-arbitrators. So this decision certainly sends a powerful message to the Qatar courts that they must heed the party's arbitration agreement. Thanks for that roundup, Alison. I think the overall message is a positive one, and we've certainly seen a more arbitration-friendly outlook in Qatar since the issuance of the new arbitration law in 2017. So that's all, all good news. I want to come back to our home turf and discuss the enforcement landscape in the UAE. Like Qatar, we also have a fairly new federal arbitration law, number six of 2018, And it's a good time to reflect on how far the UAE has come with respect to enforcement. And certainly the anecdotal evidence we have, and certainly our experience here, is that the UAE courts are increasingly enforcing awards, both foreign and domestic, and that the new expedited enforcement procedures for foreign awards are being successfully utilised. Perhaps the biggest news in 2021, at least insofar as the Emirate of Dubai is concerned, was the introduction of Dubai Decree Number 34 of 2021, which abolished the Dubai Arbitration Institute, which was housed within the DIFC, the DAI, and transferred its assets to the DIAC, the Dubai International Arbitration Centre. And as a consequence of this, the DIFC LCIA Arbitration centred no longer exists in the form as was. Now, that all remains to be seen in terms of how it plays out in practice. But in terms of enforcement, I think the main takeaway is that parties should take great care when entering into new contracts to avoid a DIFC LCIA arbitration clause. Otherwise, they'll be choosing a centre and rules that no longer exist. And this would obviously have an impact on enforceability of such clauses. But in other developments, we've seen a couple of interesting enforcement cases, which I just wanted to mention. The first was one in 2021, and it's a Dubai Court of Cassation judgment that considered whether the lack of tribunal signatures on every page of an award was a ground for annulment. It's long been a feature of UAE law and practice that arbitral awards must be signed by each arbitrator on every page, or else the local courts will not enforce them. And this is a very formalistic approach, and certainly other jurisdictions deem it sufficient if the arbitrator simply signed the final page of the award. And in fact, in 2020, we saw the ICC issue its guidance note on possible measures aimed at mitigating the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this expressly contemplated the possibility for parties to agree that awards are signed electronically. Despite this, the court in this recent case found that Article 41 of the new UAE arbitration law indeed requires that an award contains the essential details in order to be valid. And as a matter of public policy, this included the signature of all arbitrators on the operative part of the award. However, in what was quite a pragmatic approach, the court also held that an omission of tribunal signatures could be rectified by the tribunal pursuant to Article 54.6 of the law. And this article allows the court to suspend annulment proceedings for a period of 60 days so that an arbitral tribunal can rectify the form of the award without, of course, making changes to its content. So based on this, the Court of Cassation actually directed the Court of Appeal to suspend the proceedings to allow all the pages of the award to be signed and therefore effectively to fix the error and not allow a party to nullify an otherwise valid award on this basis. The second case I wanted to mention was one handed down in 2020, which concerned the incorporation of an arbitration clause by reference. Now, Article 5.3 of the new arbitration law expressly recognises incorporation of an arbitration clause by reference, while Article 7 permits incorporation by reference to a model contract, an international agreement, or any other document that includes arbitration clauses, but note, provided that the reference is clear. So Article 7 was considered by the Dubai Court of Cassation in its judgment number 1308 of 2020. 
and this held that the parties to a contract would not be bound by arbitration clauses incorporated through a general reference. So in that case, there was no specific reference to the arbitration clause in the parties signed contract, but only a general reference to the standard form agreement itself. So the incorporation of the arbitration clause by reference failed because it was effectively not clear enough. So this case provided a reality check for parties and practitioners who still need to be very careful when considering whether to incorporate a clause by reference, and if so, how, and perhaps to avoid any doubt about enforceability, being very cautious about incorporation by reference where possible. Yes, Michelle, certainly we do still get quite a few queries about whether to incorporate an arbitration clause by reference. So I think the case you mentioned here has definitely helped clarify the position as it stands under the new arbitration law. Okay, turning now to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The Saudi Centre for Commercial Arbitration, or the SCCA for short, has certainly made strong efforts in 2021 to promote the kingdom and its local courts as pro-arbitration. And, you know, they've been doing it in a very clever and persuasive way. So in 2021, I had the pleasure of interviewing Christian Alberti, the Chief of ADR and General Counsel of the SCCA, on our Arbitral Insights podcast series, and I was also delighted to speak at the SCCA's symposium at Dubai Arbitration Week. Now, both on that podcast and at the event, Christian Alberti gave a very impressive presentation of enforcement statistics that have been collated from Saudi court judgments. And the highlights of that presentation are these. So first, since the enactment of the new arbitration law in 2012, there have been 35,000 applications for enforcement of arbitral awards in Saudi Arabia, and the aggregate value of the enforced awards was $23.1 billion. Now, I was quite surprised by this figure because I hadn't appreciated how many arbitral awards have been enforced through the Saudi courts. The second point the SCCA made in their presentation was that the average time period for enforcement is 13 days, which I think seems very reasonable for this part of the world. And we know in the GCC, sometimes things can take longer in the courts. And third, of 540 judgments analysed by the SCCA, There were 107 applications to annul arbitral awards, and of these, only 6% resulted in annulment. So if you take this as a 94% chance of having your award enforced, this sounds like pretty good odds. So I think four marks there to the SCCA for embarking on a statistical analysis of this nature. It certainly goes a long way towards building users' confidence because it seems that the enforcement record being touted by the kingdom is based on facts and figures and not just sentiment or guesswork. And of course, Michelle, I think it's going to be really important for the kingdom to continue this study. And I do wonder what the figures will look like if more judgments are analysed and, of course, as time goes on. So I think on that, we simply watch this space. Yes, thank you, Alison. I agree with that completely. And I think all eyes will be on Saudi going forward as the SCCA makes its push to attract more cases across the region. So we just have enough time to briefly look at Oman, a jurisdiction I'm very familiar with due to my uh, advocacy on arbitration cases there. The first major change in the arbitration landscape generally was the issuance of the arbitration rules of the Oman Commercial Arbitration Centre, the OCAC rules, in November 2021. Now, the centre was established by royal decree in 2018, so the rules have been long awaited. So like Saudi, there will be an element of watch this space as the Oman Centre begins to take on cases. With respect to enforcement, from cases I've been involved in, it appears that the Omani courts are certainly really scrutinising grounds for challenges of arbitral awards and generally upholding awards where it is appropriate to do so. So in a 2019 case, we saw a similar argument to the what you mentioned earlier in respect of Qatar, where an award was alleged to breach public order because it was not issued in the name of the Sultan. However, 
the court ruled that the requirement to have the award issued in the name of the Sultan was absent from the Omani arbitration law, and therefore the award was not in breach of the public order. We also saw an award challenged on the basis that the contract was alleged to have been entered into via corruption and was therefore said to be void ab initio, such that the arbitration agreement was alleged to be not valid. Again, this argument was rejected by the court on the basis that the arbitration agreement is independent of the other conditions of the contract. And therefore, irrespective of whether or not the contract was actually entered into via corruption, which was not obviously addressed in that case, this did not invalidate the award. Another argument I saw used to challenge an award was that the tribunal failed to adopt the Omani law of proof, i.e. the law of evidence. However, the court ruled that the arbitral tribunal rightfully concluded that the tribunal was not bound to adopt the Omani law of proof and was free to decide the case on the balance of probabilities. So you can see the Omani courts were not accepting any of the arguments raised in these enforcement challenges, which again seems to signal an arbitration-friendly approach in Oman. Michelle, there is certainly a lot going on in the GCC enforcement space, and we've only just covered the tip of the iceberg today. If listeners have any questions about any of the content in this podcast or enforcement in the Gulf region generally, please, of course, reach out to Michelle or I and our team of arbitration lawyers in the Middle East. You can find all our details on www.readsmith.com. Arbitral Insights is a Reed Smith production. Our producer is Ali McArdle. For more information about Reed Smith's global international arbitration practice, email arbitralinsights at reedsmith.com. To learn about the Reed Smith Arbitration Pricing Calculator, a first of its kind mobile app that forecasts the cost of arbitration around the world, search Arbitration Pricing Calculator on reedsmith.com or download for free through the Apple and Google Play app stores. You can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple, Google Play, Stitcher, Readsmith.com, and our social media accounts at Readsmith LLP on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is provided for educational purposes. It does not constitute legal advice and is not intended to establish an attorney-client relationship, nor is it intended to suggest or establish standards of care applicable to particular lawyers in any given situation. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Any views, opinions, or comments made by any external guest speaker are not to be attributed to Reed Smith LLP or its individual lawyers. All rights reserved.